life-giving name of Jesus, amen. Well, good morning. Greetings from the metropolis of Dundee, Michigan. If you've been here, you know it's anything but. Well, whenever I'm going to speak, whether it's here at DCF or another church or at a conference or some navigator event, my wife always has the same two words of advice. Actually, she puts them in one sentence, short and sweet. <laughs> and um, she says that many times, like probably three times this morning before I could get out of the house, she said that. So we'll see how I do. Not surprisingly, during our nine years at the Naval Academy, her favorite speaker we got during those nine years, we got to hear multiple U.S. presidents speak at the graduation of the midshipmen as they became naval officers. And her favorite one was George Bush the Younger because when he got up, he said he was so excited to speak there for the first time as president. And he asked the admiral in charge of the Naval Academy, what should I speak about? And the admiral said, about 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> which is not surprising since some previous presidents that we had seen had gone over an hour. <laughs> but uh, so that was Anne's favorite. I don't know if she remembers anything he said, but she remembers it was short. So we'll see how I'll do. I got a picture, by the way, from Pastor Brad and his family in a text the other day. They were at Arlington National Cemetery and he just sent me a picture of a tombstone that said James Burke. And it was spelled in our strange Irish way with the O thrown in there to help people mispronounce it, B-O-U-R-K-E. And I looked him up and probably a distant relative of ours that I never met, obviously. He died in 1917 as an army surgeon, probably in World War I. But uh, Brad, if you're watching for some strange reason on vacation, you really ought to go to Annapolis. You're not far from where we lived for nine years and you'd like it. Well, today, we are going to talk about uh, the preliminary suffering of Jesus. That is, that which happened before he went to the cross. Um, I wonder if we could turn to John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. John 19, 1 through 16. And while you're turning... Um, you may know this, but the four gospel writers, although they were all reporting on the same thing, the life of Jesus on earth, and particularly the three and a half years that he ministered after he had revealed who he was, they all have a different kind of window they're looking through or purpose to their gospel, though it's all about the same thing. Uh, Matthew was seeking to prove to Jews that Jesus was the Old Testament prophet prophesied Messiah. He was the fulfillment of their Old Testament. And in Mark, his focus was to show that Jesus truly was the Son of Man, fully human. In uh, the book of Luke, he announces his, his uh, objective as, uh, hey, uh, other people have written about this, but I thought it might be good to have an orderly one. Uh, and every, every movie that's ever been made about the life of Jesus uses the book of Luke because it's the only one that claims to be chronological, that is, in order. It's like the other guys were like, oh, oh, yeah, and then there was this one time, and they're not really putting it in order. And, of course, the book of John, which we're going to read from, he makes his uh, objective clear toward the end of his book when he says, by, by reading this, we pray you believe that he is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So, if we could, let's stand together wherever you are, here or at home, if you're able to. And I will read John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him with a purple robe. And they went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! and they punched him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priest and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. 
and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize that I have the power to either free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to act to set Jesus free. But the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Let me pray. Father, we ask that as we read and explore this passage of what Jesus went through even before the cross, that we would have a whole new ability to identify with the 12 and their fear, the emotions they were experiencing. Most of them were still running in the other direction as, we, as this happened that we just read. That you might invade our souls with a fresh wind of gratefulness for our king, the king of kings like no other king. And Lord, help us to realize as we're, we recoil from what we explore today, that Jesus had only begun to suffer for us in this passage. We ask you this in Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know about you, but I experience a rather odd tension when it comes to looking on the suffering of Christ, rather it be in the pages of scripture, like the passages like the one I just read, or in a movie like The Passion of the Christ. In one way, it's an unbearable tragedy that I can hardly stand to look at or even think about for too long. And yet, in another way, it's the sweetest moments in human history. In one sense, it's like ultimate humiliation as I watch what happened to Jesus. And in another, the scriptures say it's a moment of supreme victory from another perspective. If you're older like me, you might remember that there used to be a show on ABC called The Wide World of Sports. Does anyone remember that? ABC's Wide World of Sports. Hey, more than I thought might. And what was their little tagline in the intro every time? The, th the thrill of victory in the agony of defeat. Now you young folks, you'll just have to forgive us old folks as we reminisce. Uh, there were some great scenes to indicate both. But in a sense, Jesus is suffering, again, whether in the pages of scripture like this passage or on film, it's kind of both together all at once, both the agony of defeat and the thrill of victory all at once. Colossians 2.15 says something rather shocking. It says of Jesus and his suffering, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Now, to human eyes, who was being made a public spectacle at the cross? Jesus. But God's perspective, as it is so often true, is upside down from us. And he says he made a spectacle of the powers and authorities on the cross. It's both at once the agony of defeat and the thrill of victory. Though this is his preliminary suffering we read about today and that we're going to talk about today before he gets to the cross, before he even carries his cross, I think this is even more shocking and unnerving for me. Like, how many of you have seen the movie The Passion of the Christ? Wasn't the part where they just flogged and beat and tortured and mocked Jesus even harder to watch than the cross? Maybe it's because, you know, the cross has shown pretty pretty well in almost every movie that we ever um, see about Jesus, and we talk about it a lot. And that part that's, it, although it is mentioned in detail, as I just read, we don't really see that so much brutally uh, shown as we did in that particular movie. But I think it may have even been more shocking for the 12 than the cross. Now it's true that perhaps only two of them were there to see these things, John and Peter. 
And even while he was there and hadn't run away like most of the others, Peter was busy denying Jesus and being humiliated himself. But I think when they saw that brutal pre-torture that we read about today, that had to be so shocking to them because Jesus had been warning them that this was going to happen to them. In fact, I want to read one particular passage from the book of Mark, one of the other Gospels, Mark 10, 32 to 34. And by the way, isn't it interesting that the book of John, I'm sure Brad has mentioned this, that half of the book of John nearly is about the last week of Jesus's life or less. The whole first half is, is the other three plus years put together of his life on earth. And the second half of it from chapter 12 on is all about the last few days that he was on earth. But here's what it says in Mark 10, 32 to 34. It says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Another way to say that is the disciples were freaked out and the rest of the folks following were in sheer terror. Again, he took the 12 aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They'll condemn him to death and they'll hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Well, we know from other passages as well as that one, they couldn't even process that. They didn't know what it meant. In fact, in one of the Gospels, right after Jesus said that, with all that detail about the torture he would be enduring, it says they went around behind him saying, what does rise from the dead mean? What does rise after three days? In, in this particular passage, the very next things that happen is they start asking, they start arguing about who can be in the best positions in heaven. They really didn't get it. They could not absorb it. It was more than they could bear. But now there was no denying it when they saw that brutal torture. Oh, man, they had to realize, whoa, this is really happening. And then suddenly remembering and making sense of the many times he had warned them. They were disoriented and they were distressed ever since the arrest happened, I'm sure, at the garden. This had become painfully clear. A couple of things I want to mention before we get to some potential takeaways for us. The first point in my outline um, here is a coerced collaboration became a perverse partnership. A coerced collaboration becomes a perverse partnership. And then some contrasts and clarifications and finally some, some maybe some meditating on what we could take away from this. So what I mean by this first point, a coerced collaboration. People that were bitter enemies of one another actually teamed up during the arrest, the trial, the torture, and finally the crucifixion of Jesus. Think about it. Bitter rivals became strange bedfellows in this. What led up to these moments of torture was as unlikely as it was unseemly, as Romans and Jews worked together to make this happen. The religious and the irreligious worked together to make this happen. There's a perverse little, little sentence in Luke 23, 12. I still remember reading it the first time. I wasn't even a believer yet. I was actually in boot camp reading my Bible under the covers. I was talking with you about boot camp and how God can use that. Um, and it was kind of my, my leading up to becoming a believer. But here's what Luke 23, 12 says. And I wrote in the margin of my Bible back then at 20 years old, sick in all caps with, a, with an exclamation point. It says, that day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before that, they were enemies. Can you imagine? They became friends over the brutal treatment and illegal conviction of our Savior. There's an old saying that nothing makes better friends than a mutual enemy, and I guess that happened that day. And in the end, a doubly frightened ruler, Pontius Pilate. He was both frightened of the Jews. They were manipulating him, right? The things they were shouting, hey, there's only one king, Caesar, so if you don't crucify this guy, it might get back to Caesar that you're not as loyal as he thought you were, and so on and so forth. He was also very frightened of riots starting in Jerusalem, which also would get him in trouble and perhaps killed by the crowd. So he was afraid of that, but we also watch him in chapter 18 and 19 of John, his fear of who Jesus just might be, 
grew and grew and grew as he interviewed him. You remember that part we just read where he goes in and after they said that he claimed to be the son of God and he goes, where, where, where'd you come from? And then, you know, Jesus won't answer him. And then he says, don't you realize that part? He goes, you'd have no power unless it was given to you from on high. He says he became even more afraid and he just wanted to set Jesus free very badly. But he was more frightened of his earthly life being cost him or even just his position. So he ended up cowering over the wrong thing and surrendering Jesus for crucifixion. Let's take a quick glimpse into his mind. Pontius Pilate. By the way, it, I don't know about you, but I'm a geek that kind of likes to follow um, things like archaeology. Um, someone said, I heard your career lies in ruins, Tom. You know, so, so there, there's, there's some of that. But I, I enjoy how every time they dig something up in Judea, it con further confirms what the scriptures say. They have yet to dig something up. They're like, oh, hey, this proves the Bible isn't true. And often that's the motive of those who are digging. <laughs> but they keep on endorsing or ratifying or confirming the scriptures. Not long ago, just a few years ago, they had struggled for years to find a historical record that actually referred to a guy named Pontius Pilate. But they found it not too long ago. There was a real man named Pontius Pilate. And we now have proof. I can't remember if they found... Uh, a tombstone or a, a, a sign that used to be over the place where he lived, whatever it was, they found something, Pontius Pilate. And this guy, taking a glimpse into what was going on via his, via his conversations with Jesus in this and in chapter 18 leading up to this and in some of the other gospels, he had no interest in this case, none at all. He was ambivalent at first and he was horrified as it went on. He had, you know, they came to him, and he, his only concern was, get this out of my court. This isn't my thing. This is your thing. Just totally uninterested in Jesus or his trial. Then there was this confusion about Jesus, as we just referenced, but there's many other passages in John 18, verses 33 through 37, and in the passage we just read in particular, I'd point out verses 7 and 8 and verses 11 and 12 in chapter 19, where you just see him. And there's, there's a passage, I think it's in Matthew, I forgot to look up the reference, where his wife comes to him and says, hey, I had a dream about that guy. I have nothing to do with him. And he got even more afraid. So there's like this increments of him getting more and more kind of reverentially scared out of his wits about who Jesus was. This growing fear of Jesus, however, was overcome by his greater dread of the Roman authorities, as I just mentioned. The, the little thing he does with, with washing his hands before he hands Jesus over in some of the Gospels it mentions, you know, a symbolic, this is not, this is not on me, it's on you guys. That, that was a very weak, too little, too late uh, th ritual hand washing by him. He is the man from the human side, the governmental authorities that gave permission to crucify Jesus, sent Jesus to the that day's equivalent of the electric chair. A coerced collaboration became a perverse partnership. You hear those Jews yelling to him, hey, you know, you're no friend to Caesar. If you... They hated Caesar. They hated the Romans. But they hated Jesus even more. And so that was all it took for them to temporarily side, supposedly, at least externally, with the Romans. Some contrasts and clarifications that I thought would be worth pointing out. This especially horrifying part of the torture of Jesus, the being punched out, the, the, the crown of thorns beat down with a rod so that it would sink deeply into his skull, the blood flowing down his face, the purple robe being put on him while they mocked him and punched him in the face and spit on him, a whole company of soldiers taking turns doing such things and then pulling the robe back off after the, it had congealed with the blood. Can you imagine how that felt? All that especially horrifying torture to you and me was not what Jesus was sweating in the Garden of Gethsemane. As, as odd as that sounds to us, that is not what he was scared about. Um, notice that he had near crushing fear in the Garden of Gethsemane. And yet, when this was all going on, this physical torture, he was completely silent and complicit. Absolutely not unnerved by it. 
It was not until the moment when 2 Corinthians 5.21 was fulfilled on the cross, which you'll hear more about maybe next week, that he began to freak out emotionally. And he said, well, does anybody know what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says without looking it up? I bet you do. You just didn't remember the, the address. Uh, it says, he became sin for us. In the moment on the cross, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was filled with horror then. It was because of the spiritual suffering of the father turning away. Remember how he'd said again and again in the Gospels, my father is always with me. But for those moments, he was not. And that's when he experienced the greatest suffering for him. But to us, this preliminary actually looks worse. Likely Jesus died, scholars say, not from his physical wounds, but from a broken heart because of the Father's turning away. How do we know that? Well, we can see plainly that that was the greater suffering for him. And also, do you know that the other two guys that were being crucified on each side were still alive hours later? And the soldiers had to break their legs to make sure they were dead before the sun set. Jesus was already dead. And they were kind of surprised by that, if you read the accounts. And they remember they stuck the, the spear in his side. To, Is he really dead? Because that was not typical. But Jesus, it says, gave up his spirit and died in many ways of a broken heart, emotionally broken heart. During this hardest part for me to see or think about, as I mentioned, he was calm and mostly silent. Isaiah 53, I want to read a little bit out of Isaiah 53. You can turn there if you want, or you can just listen along. But it's amazing to realize that Isaiah 53 was written centuries before Jesus came, and it's perfectly fulfilled in Jesus. It says this, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And then jumping ahead to verses 10 and 11, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, that was written. A perfect description of the Savior to come. Overwhelmingly, as I mentioned, theologians agree that his soul agony was much greater than his human agony suffering agony, the physical agony, though, though that causes us to recoil. With our up down, upside down perspective from God's, we are more horrified by the physical than by the spiritual. And that might even be the way we think about hell. You know, those that don't know Christ ending up in hell, what, what gets our attention when we think about hell? Darkness, flames, all the physical elements that are represented in that. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 makes it clear that our greatest agony if we would ever end up in hell and turn away from Jesus would be the fact that we are eternally separated from God and shut out from the majesty of the Lord. Just as with Jesus in eternity, the greater suffering is the spiritual, not the physical. The good news is, of course, we trust in what Jesus did for us. We don't have to go there. And it should motivate us to pray like crazy and to love on our friends that don't know him yet so that they don't go there. By the way, there's a popular notion that hell doesn't really exist. It's some sort of theological metaphor. I would challenge you to read the four gospels and what Jesus said about hell and still think that was the case. All right, the other thing I wanted to mention real quick before we get the takeaways for us is, I don't know about you, but because I'm so horrified and recoil at this idea of Jesus' suffering from the stuff we read about today all the way through the cross. I gotta be honest, sometimes I struggle with the songs that talk about how wonderful the cross is. I mean, 
I agree in a kind of conceptual, theological, cranial sort of way that the cross is wonderful, as we even mentioned earlier. But, you know, they're written like, so, like, man, I really love the cross. The cross is so cool. And I think, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be going through to get there, but I must have a ways to go yet. Because I, I do believe the scriptures, you know, the Apostle Paul seemed to love the cross that way. I wonder if I must first face the full horror of both his physical and spiritual torture and agony before I could get to that place. Only then, maybe, can I come full circle to find ultimate hope in the cross and offer full, authentic, emotional, and spiritual worship there. I wonder. I want a shortcut. Can we just not look at all that horror and just kind of go right to, oh, the cross? Uh, but I think I can't really get all the way there if I don't face it head on. Both in myself and in my other believing friends, I think I see much reticence to engage that fully. Well, keeping my wife's words in mind, I'm going to try and bring this to a close. Um, some potential takeaways for us. One is to realize it is human to turn away from brutality and torture. The other night we saw a movie on Netflix and we watched about five minutes before I said, no, I can't watch that, honey. And it was called, I think it was called My Friend Ann. And it was the, written by the best friend of Anne Frank and all that she went through in the, in the camps and so forth with the Nazis. And I was just like, I don't think I wanna watch this. And we didn't. Um, I freely admit I'm more of a wimp than my wife many times, and that was one of them. I think she was going to watch it. Um, but, you know, if we think about this brutality that Jesus went through, I think it would be accurate to say the 12 could not bear it, Pilate could not own it, Peter could not watch it, and the women could not leave it. Isn't it interesting that while the men were all running with their tail between the legs, the the women were all still there at the cross and during this torture. Amazing. In, in the Passion of the Christ, you might remember that Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, and the other Mary, Mary Magdala, got on their hands and knees with uh, cloths that Pilate's wife had given them to clean up Jesus' blood from the pavement. They were there. But we're not alone in this tendency to want to turn away from something so brutal. But as I mentioned earlier, nevertheless, I may need to face down my reluctance to fully engage these things with my eyes wide open. If I continue to refuse to really meditate on that or look at it for long, even in my mind's eye, I might save myself some heartache and some distressful nausea, but I might also truncate my full appreciation of both not only the brutality, but the beauty of the suffering of Jesus. I may never get to the kind of grateful all, awe and all in love for him that awaits me at that cross if I will face it down. And then I thought, well, how might I pursue this counterintuitive goal of facing the unfaceable? I don't know if any of these will resonate with you, but they did with me and I've done some of them in the last week or two as I've got ready for this. I thought, well, perhaps I could start with what I've always wanted to turn away from in this regard. So I rewatched those scenes in the passion of the Christ, of his being mocked and beaten and punched out and flogged and spit on. I don't wanna watch that, but I made myself, and I think I need to do it a few more times. And then there's an old, now this is really getting old, this is even getting older than some of the things I asked earlier. Any of you ever heard of Mike Warnke? Remember Mike Warnke? Okay, those of you that nodded, I now know how old you are. Um, uh, you're, you're pretty near as old as me. Mike Warnke, on one of his albums called A Jester in the King's Court, has a description of the flogging that's absolutely unnerving. He goes into tremendous historical detail of what the flogging instrument even was and how it worked. And you know, I checked and it's on YouTube and I listened to it again. And I would encourage you, if, you've, if, if this resonates with you, yeah, maybe I need to face this down a little more directly instead of glossing over it or turning away in my heart. Those would be two things that I'd recommend that could be a start to looking at it. 
And if you think I'm out to lunch, well, then don't do that. Uh, I'd like to just have a few moments of prayer, and I will close after giving you a few moments to just think, what if any takeaway the Lord might have for you as it relates to this passage of Jesus' pre-cross torture? Lord, um, we're really, really humbled and quite frankly disturbed when we read of these things or see them depicted in a movie or imagine the full-on reality of them in our own hearts. I'm mindful of Romans 5, 7, and 8, which says very rarely will will someone die for a righteous person. But for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, we're amazed that you would come from heaven. Even just living in this world had to be difficult and brutal for you at times. But then to go through what you went through for us and the part that we are horrified by clearly is not even the worst part. We can't quite imagine that. We just want to pause and give you thanks and worship you. And Lord, if there's anything you'd want any of us to do, to just follow through a little more on this, facing down the horror of what you endured for us, we ask that you'd lead us and give us the clarity and the courage to do that. In the name of Christ, our Savior, amen. Stand together and respond by delighting in or maybe struggling with the great sacrifice that has been made for us. Would you please join us in singing?